right. Hey, good morning. Hey, that, that's my, uh, my walk-up song now from this point on. <laughs> hey, Rangers, right? That's my walk-up song. Uh, hey, it's great to see you all today. And uh, yes, it's wonderful to share in the Lord's Supper together and, and to kick off summer. Now, summer doesn't start until June 21st, I think it is. But it uh, feels like summer, doesn't it? How many kids are out of school? Are we out of school? Yeah, we had a bunch of graduations, getting a lot of invitations to come and celebrate our students who are graduating, heading off to college. Now, parents, that's your cue. Start weeping um, or rejoicing. I don't know. They could go either way. But hey, we're, I'm so pumped about the summer, and I love summertime. This is like my favorite time of the year. And uh, we're going to be going, you saw it, we're going on a Romans road trip this summer. How many of you have a road trip planned? Anybody got trips planned? Maybe you're going on a plane, something like that. When we were, uh, when Stacy and I were, were, mar- were, were first married and, you know, young kids, um, of course, we have twin daughters and a son. And when they were little, uh, we would always go on road trips. You know, you didn't want to fly with, with three little ones. And um, so uh, our parents, we, we moved away from our parents when we got married. And so we would always go on these road trips. And some of you know I'm from Charlotte. So we travel across the southeast and down to Houston and all around with kids. And some of you have done that. I was on a trip. One time we went on this trip, one of those two-day, like 12-hour days, you know, with a hotel in the middle along the way with little ones. And um, I had packed everything up on, uh, on this, in this carrier, luggage carrier on top of the minivan, right? And, um, and so we're, we're, we're cruising along, went, you know, had... Pretty good weather, went through some rain at one point, and then, um, you know, pretty smooth. And then we're there at the hotel. Took everything out of the, the luggage bin or whatever it was there at the hotel, pretty much. That's when I learned there's a difference between weather-resistant and waterproof. <laughs> Those are two different things. All the way, I mean, to the, to the center of our luggage, everything is wet. Um, I still don't know what weather resistant means. I'm not sure what that means. But and now I know at least what it doesn't mean. I think this shirt is weather resistant is what that means. Um, but anyway, I remember another trip. I think we're coming back this way from, 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 uh, from Charlotte, from North Carolina, the beach or something. And we had made enough stops, okay, enough potty breaks, right? And um, now I know some of, y- some of y'all, laugh. there's more drastic measures at this point when you like, no, we're not stopping. Um, you know, we take care of whatever, but we ain't stopping. Uh, you know, you get to that point, but there was enough whining and such. So we finally, we, I, I pulled over at a rest stop. We're not going to gas station. We're not, we're, we're stopping. We're going to go to the bathroom. Let's go. Before we get back in the car, we have a broken arm. I don't know how this happens. <laughs> like with hours to go on the trip. So maybe you have trips like ours. Sometimes they don't go so well. We have great memories though too. Could share those along the way. But I am excited about road trips. I think later in the summer we're going to make another road trip out to, um, to Colorado. So uh, love this time of the year. You probably have great stories to tell, but what we're going to do together, we're going to all go on this road trip together. So I mean, we're going to all pack in. I mean, there's a lot of us, and we're going to walk through this thing together. But know this, we're we're going to not just look at Romans. And you know this, if if you just engage with God's Word on Sunday mornings, like, well, I'm glad Jeff, he seems to have studied this. He's worked hard for this message, I think. He seems to know his stuff. Look at it. Then no, no, you're supposed to be doing this. Like all week long, we're reading through Scripture together. You can dive in, jump in, still join us, particularly this summer. Good time to start with us. We're in Job right now. But uh, we want you to be memorizing Scripture throughout the summer. We want you to dive deep into Romans because we're going to walk through this story. So go ahead and turn uh, uh, this journey together. Uh, Romans 1. Go ahead and grab your Bible there. Turn to Romans 1. And we're going to uh, go on this journey, not unlike um, Pilgrim's Progress. I'm curious, how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? Anybody? Yeah, lots of us have. If you haven't, I challenge you to do that this summer. Poolside or wherever you might be, maybe in the car, on a road trip, read uh, Pilgrim's Progress. It's a classic allegory. Maybe you know that. John Bunyan, 1678, I think it was. Um, it's a little clunky with Old English, but not so much. And in it, um, Christian, okay, Pilgrim, Christian, is making his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. And he goes you know, to places like uh, the Valley of Humiliation um, with his traveling companion, Faithful. He goes to uh, th- this, this place called Um, the Tower of Doubt, and he encounters the giant despair. So it's that kind of thing, uh, and it's really, really interesting. You ought to read it. Every believer probably ought to read it. 
and because it's such a classic. He makes his way to the celestial city is where he's heading. And so we're going to do something sort of like that, stopping along the way, different spots as we move along the way. And our starting point today is Sin City. All right. Sin City. I'm not talking about Vegas. In fact, a more theologically uh, accurate word would be the word depravity. Not a word we use a whole lot, but it's the best word. The word it's actually comes from a Latin word, depravitas. Uh, pravis is the root. Pravis, you hear the word perverse. Um, depravity is perverse. It means crooked, okay, bent. The, the reformers describe sin as being bent, turned in on itself. I think it was Augustine, prior to the reformers, said it, sin is turned inward, bent toward, toward itself. So we're, we're broken. We're, this is the doctrine of original sin, if you've heard that. And, and it's this. This is so important to understand. Sin is not bad behavior up against good behavior. A lot of Christians believe that. So we never really embrace the grace of God. We believe that we're saved by grace, but we don't, some don't believe, don't act like we believe that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, as we'll see today. And so it's so important to understand that sin is a condition of the heart. It's not behavior as much. Yes, it results in that, as we're going to see today. And then one who's saved results in good behavior, what Paul would say, righteousness, all right? So look at chapter 1. Paul introduces himself. This makes sense, doesn't it? When you write a letter to someone, would it make sense to say, hey, it's Jeff, you know, instead of who wrote this letter? Who is this from? So they, in common in the day, say who you are, who, you know, explain maybe who you are a bit. In fact, he wants to come to Rome. So these are some people he knows, but he is longing to come and be with them. He notes that uh, he's been set apart for the gospel. He talks about Christ, the, the, the son of God, who was the descendant from David. You see verse 3? We talked about this last week. He's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant all the way through the Old Testament. Declared the Son of God in power. He's even been resurrected from the dead. And then he says, we are going to be obedient to him. We're going to share his name, proclaim his name among all the nations. And he says, and you, including you, those who belong to Christ there in Rome. These are Gentiles and Jews, by the way. To all those in Rome, he says in verse 7, who are loved by God. And called to be saints. That word is holy ones. Then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So then he, so there's the intro, all right? And I bust through that because I want us to get to really verse 16 and beyond. But then he says, um, hey, first thing I want to say, thank you. Or I just praise God for you, actually. He says, thank God for you. Look at his gratitude. I love this. I was reading this this week and I felt the same way when I thought about you. When I look across this room, see faces and people I love, and I think, I just praise God for you. You know, you've, maybe you've seen the ministry report. You're going to get one in the mail, I think, if you remember. If you haven't, it'll be online as well. But tonight we're coming together to celebrate what God's done. We're going to pray towards the next ministry year that we have upcoming. An incredible uh, time to focus on what God's called us to. But I just stopped and I thought, man, I love you. I love our church family so much. And so just as Paul, uh, you know, I, just a pastor's love for his people, he says, I'm under obligation to preach to the Greeks primarily, he says, and I'm eager to preach in Rome as well. Then he gets right to the point. All right. So watch this. Uh, here's what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to outline this. If you take notes. We're going to go through what I might call our first leg of the journey. We're going to go through Arville, okay? Or maybe it's the state of R, because we're going to look at God's righteousness. We're going to look at God's revelation. We're going to look at uh, God's, or our rejection, God's response, and then ultimately our redemption, all right? So first, God's righteousness. This is the key theme. I'm going to spend some time on this, because this is critical to understand. This word is diakosune, okay? Everybody say diakosune. Yakasune. All right, impress your friends over lunch and just talk about how much you know Greek. Um, because when you, when, as a pastor, when you say, the Greek says, then you can just rattle off anything and people don't really know. Because what that means is like give more money or something, you know, but it doesn't. Okay. Um, righteousness, diakasune, is a key word in understanding. All right. And when we look at this, there, Paul's going to say, hey, there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, there's good news and bad news, and I'm just going to tell you from the start, be forewarned, our trip doesn't start off well. Uh, have you ever had a trip like that? 
like you're packing and you're just, oh, the kids are all, oh my gosh, everybody's getting in the car, we're going to have fun, you know, and you just kind of wish you weren't going, like kids don't even want to go, and maybe you and the missus or your, your husband, you've been arguing, and you, you know, and it's so hard to get to vacation, right? Well, some trips just don't start off well. Maybe you have stories like that. Our trip does not start off well at all. I just want, to, want you to know. But there's good news at the beginning. Earth-shaking, paradigm-breaking news. And Paul puts it like this. Look at verse 16. Here it is, verse 16 to 17. Now, y'all, listen. This is the entire point of the book. I mean, this is his focus. It's right here. So you can make a note of that if you want. Circle 16, 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the euangelion in the Greek, for it is the power, dunamis, dynamite, power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which was mind-blowing as well, to the Greek as well, not just God's people, as it were. For in it, what is it? The Gospel, thank you. In it, the gospel, the righteousness of God, the diakosune of God is revealed from faith for faith. Now, I think ESV might miss it here, at least not so simple language for us. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The NIV says, if you have it, by faith from first to last. I like the Living Bible. It says faith from start to finish. Another way of saying it's all faith. It's what the reformers called faith. Uh, sola fide in the Latin. Faith alone is, what, is where that, that uh, you know, doctrine came from, if you will, and throughout Scripture. But faith alone is what Paul is saying. And he's saying, this is really good news. In fact, for a hardcore Jew, this is mind-blowing. And here's what I mean. I want to unpack this for a moment. There's three ways to relate to God. Most people only know two of them. The first one is religion. That is to say, a set of beliefs, right? Um, a system of beliefs. I must do these things in order to somehow appease God and relate to Him. I've got to do these things if I want to have relationship with Him, right? The other is irreligion, which is like no religion. Okay, just run from religion. Most people in the world today, and it's all Paul knew, most people only know, well, the only way you can relate is religion or non-religion. There's only two ways to go here. And by the way, irreligion is actually a strategy. Both of these are actually strategies to remove God altogether. And if we're not careful, we fall into the same. We run with truth or grace, I could call it. Um, and, and, and many of us run this way, even as Christians. And, and so what I'm saying is a lot of times it's, it's um, well, I'm going to bring something to the mix. I'm, gonna, I'm helping God out. I bring something to the table. You bring nothing to the table regarding your salvation, but the sin that, that makes it necessary. That's all we bring. We need to understand from, from you know, that which we've been saved from. And, and then the other side of that, the irreligion, is when you hear people, well, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious. That's real common today. Spiritual but not religious. That's another way of saying, I don't want to enter into covenant relationship with anybody else in community. I don't need some structure of, of, of belief that's going to tell me how to live my life. Both are, are, are ways to eliminate God altogether. One is, I will do the work to get myself to God. The other is, don't need that. I'm going to live however I want to live. Because ultimately, the gospel in this secular world now is freedom. That's, that's the gospel. Anything that's going to keep me from that, being who I want to be, you do you, I'll do me, then that is, that's sin, is what that is. But there's a third way. Praise be to God. And this could be mind-blowing for some of us here today. The third way is the gospel. It is the euangelion, the good news. The Jesus way is not religion or irreligion. It's not work harder, get better, appease God, be morally upright. That's not the Christian faith. It leads towards that. That's not it. It's believe more deeply by faith what Christ has already accomplished. Nor is it run from religion. Have nothing to do with all of that and structure and people and all those things. And it's central to understand this portion of, of, of really the whole book of Romans is to understand this word dikaiosune. Uh, dikaiosune is, is throughout Paul's letter. And this is the word righteousness. Now listen, it means, it's, it's a real deep word, so there's really three different meanings. The word diakosune means justice, it means right. It means fair. 
It means equity. It means all of those things. But here's how this plays out. Three meanings, really. The first one is, it's a characteristic of God. It's a character trait of God. He's righteous. You can say he's perfect in all of his ways. He, how about this? He always makes the right decision. Every time. He is just. He's right. He's fair. So it's a, it's a character trait of God. Secondly, it's how we relate to one another. So all the Romans would have known this word, diakosune, as meaning uh, being, being equitable or fair. Uh, being, it's equity. In fact, there's this uh, Greek goddess at the time, Equitas, um, who was on every coin that they had. They'd see it every day. Equitas was the kind of like, um, what, Lady Justice in our day in the world of jurisprudence. She actually has on the coin, she has these scales of, of justice. Every uh, Roman would have heard this diakosune as, okay, you have fair justice, fairness, Right, what is right. And then a third way to understand this word is something that is actually not just a character trait of God, but something that he, 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 he gives or, or, or the word is imputes into those who follow after him, as we're going to see. Now, this is the part that would blow our minds, that this diakosune, so important to the gospel, is actually something that God imparts to those who believe, okay, by faith, who come to him. So this truth in verse 17 changed Paul's life. Remember, he's a prototype Jew. All he knew was the way of religion. And he's crushed by a religious system. Some Christians are like this. If you don't get this right, your Christian life will be joyless. It will be a beatdown. If it's, I've got to just work harder to get better. I got, I'm supposed to be just like Jesus. I think he was perfect. How do I, I can't do that. You've got to come to understand this. That the diakosune is a, in this righteousness that come outside of ourselves is so important. 1,500 years later, the great reformer Martin Luther read these verses and this concept of a righteousness outside of himself blew his mind. Think about this. How crazy is this? From Paul, we go then to, to Martin Luther, John Calvin, and other reformers, 1,500. Now they're in a religious system that is crushing. It's the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And he, can't, he knows, I can't be good enough to appease a righteous, holy God. And so he's trying to do all that he can. So he discovers this. And, 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 and Luther, here's what he wrote later. He had literally a tower experience. When I discovered that, okay, this righteousness outside of myself, he called it an alien righteousness. In Latin, they use this term extra nos, outside of us. A righteousness outside of anything that I do. He says, when I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. A priest, born again, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. It changed his life, and it sparked the Reformation. I want all of us to see why this is so life-changing. And the challenge for us, some of us just kind of cultural Christians, we were like, I get this, I got this. Righteousness of God, I get this, I've received it, good, I got this. Friends, if you are not living your life sold out to God every single day, I'm not sure you've got this at all. This great news drives us to worship Him with every aspect of our lives. So there's really good news is what I want you to hear first. That's what Paul wants you to know. But watch this. There's really bad news. This is now the rest of the chapter. All right? So hang on. There's really bad news. This bad news runs throughout the rest of the chapter. For the wrath of God, look at verse 18, is revealed from heaven. He introduces this subject matter, wrath, revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress, okay, watch that, push down, push away the truth. Ungodliness and unrighteousness, another way of saying, you know, we're all called the the chief purpose of man is to love God and love others. That's the great commandment. And ungodliness and unrighteousness is not doing those two things. Loving God and loving others. So here's, I want to explain this, wrath, all right? Wrath is so a key theme to understand here as well. A lot of us think God gets angry like we do. Like you get angry with your kids, or you're really, you know, you just lash out, or you're out of control. Somebody said something and you're upset. You're playing basketball. Some guy comes at you and, okay, we're going at it now. That's not, God, God doesn't do that. God's not out of control, ever. Um, Wrath is His holy reaction to sin. So whatever is not of Him, 
He hates. With a fury, he hates. Anything that is not of God. So I, I could say it this way. He hates anything that would come against what he loves. His creation. All that is right and fair and just. He hates anything that would come against his, us, his, his, his humans that he's created in his image. I could say it this way. I hate cancer. I hate it. Because of what it's done to people I love. It's taken the lives of people I love. It's impacted my, my family in, in different ways. I hate cancer. And in, a, in, 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 gosh, exponentially more. God hates anything that would come against what He loves. And anything that would come against your life, He hates. He, he hates anything that would come against it. So, so this theme of, of wrath runs from verse 18 all the way to chapter 3, verse 19. And Paul's objective is very clear. Y'all listen to this. Here's his objective. He wants to end all the noise about there is no God, the debates about whether there's a God or not. And he wants to end all discussion about whether we can somehow get to God on our own through our good works, our intelligence, or whatever else. Look at what he says. I'm going to catapult you into chapter 3, I mean, yeah, chapter 3, verse 19. Look at what he says. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, now understand this. The law, this is God's perfect standard revealed in His divine qualities. And his eternal attributes, his perfect standard under law, so that every mouth may be stopped. We'll just end all the talk, and the whole world may be accountable, held accountable to God. The whole world. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. He's saying there's, you're never going to be good enough. This has been revealed. How has this been revealed? Paul tells us. You're going to see here the lot, this, this brilliant mind that Paul walks us through he, this, these, these categories. And, and so he said, how is this going to be? Re well, watch this. Here's the next one. God's revelation. Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain. It's evident to them. How is this? Because God's made it, made it, sh he's shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, clearly seen, experienced ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So God has revealed. Think about this. Every soul on the planet, to the core of our being, we know God exists. In every village, every city, every town around the world today, people are worshiping God. Every civilization worships God in some way. Every civilization has some kind of moral code. You can't function together if there's not some sense of morality in a community. God has planted us there. It's the moral argument for His existence. But, but Paul's just saying, okay, look, He's revealed Himself to us. Through creation, Psalm 19 says the heavens declare His glory, right? The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day, night to night, it's nonstop He's proclaiming Himself. We've gotten so whip and smart in the modern West that we want to debate whether God exists or not. I just don't think that. I don't know. We're so whip and smart. Now watch where this goes. What happens when we reject this clear uh, revelation of God? General revelation, we call it in theology. Well, he tells us. See, watch. Here's his logical progression. Verse 21. For although they knew God, you know, they knew of Him, they knew He existed, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were hardened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so back in verse 18, remember? Suppressing the truth. This means to push down, push away. Uh, truth is revealed and rejected. This is why I've said, I, initially, there are no atheists in the world. There are no true atheists in the world. And some of you, like me, you can say, well, Jeff, no, I know, I know some guy, I know a guy who doesn't believe in God. He's suppressing the truth constantly. And we'll see where that goes. But I've likened, some of you all heard me, I likened the atheist to the guy who, uh, who went out and bought himself a new boomerang, about killed himself trying to throw away his old one. Right? I mean, it's like, there, there is no God. 
There is no God. And we see sunsets like we see here in, in the summertime. <laughs> Whoa! There is no God. A baby's born. <laughs> There's no God. And then she falls in love. We fall. In, you know, where's that come from? Constantly coming back to us. The atheists, the unbelievers, constantly suppressing the truth that God exists. In fact, God gives it. What's his assessment of all this? God's assessment is Psalm 14.1. Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's no, no one who does good. So no one, listen to this, friends, listen. No one stands on judgment day and says, um, God, listen, you may not have heard this before, but I have a really good excuse as to why I did not believe and follow you. There's no excuse. Paul's going to great lengths here to make this point. And so here's our memory verse. This is how it's summed up here. Our memory verse for the week. All right. Next two weeks, we're going to be real easy. We're giving you all a real easy one at first. This is a single verse. Romans 3, 23. Let's all say it together. All right. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right. We, we thought we'd give you a little easy one first. Jesus wept. That's easier, but that's another verse. It has nothing to do with Romans, uh, really. So, um, except that he's weeping over our sin, right? So look, God, our rejection. Now watch God's response. What's his response to our rejection? What then does God do? Paul tells us. See this? Therefore. And so, right? You know that. Whenever you see therefore, you ask what it's. And, and so because we've rejected God, everything goes out of control. Look at what happens here. Therefore, God gave them up. Let me ask you this. Does God ever give up on us? Does God ever? Paul, again, Paul's not mixing words. He gave them up. Gave them up to what? In the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. I mean, that's what, you know, we're going to run first. I won't, I'll do me. I want to satisfy me. All these cravings and passions I have in my body, in my mind. I'm just going to fulfill those. I'm going to take those on. I have no restraints. I'm just going to go after what I want because they exchange the truth of God about God for a lie. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Look, God gave them over. He gives up. It's, it's God's way of saying, you want to live as if I don't exist? Have at it. Where does that go? He's going to tell us. He's going to tell us. Look at this. And so in verses uh, 24... Really, through 30, it's the rest of the chapter. Look at verse uh, yeah, 26 we just read. God gave them up. But 26 says, uh, up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Watch this. Paul argues for natural, um, what we see in nature. He argues from creation. Here's what's natural. Men and women naturally fit together. That's what he's saying here. And then he says, and likewise, men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So in their, in their minds, their conscience, their, their lives, their, their own bodies, um, they're, they're, they're impacted by this unnatural desire. That which is not natural is what he's saying. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Look at this, verse 28. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of un unrighteousness. There's that word again. Now watch how he plays this out. Now just when we think, well, read, read those verses ahead, say, well, I'm, I'm good, I'm clear, I'm all good. Watch this. Evil, covetousness, coveting your neighbor's stuff, desiring more watching ads on TV, can't get enough, malice. They are full of envy, always envying other people. I mean, you, can't, you, you just got to be one up on everybody else. People got more likes than you got. It's murder in all of its forms, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, uh-oh, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Children, this is for you, all right? That's where we go. And we don't want to follow God. We move out from under the umbrella 
of authority of our parents. God, our parents, and us. And what happens, we pull out of that, and your parents guide you to get out of the rain, right? Foolish, faith, faithless, um, heartless, he says. And then he, then he closes out. He closes all of it out with verse 32. Here we go. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but wow, give approval to those who practice them. Anybody think this sounds a lot like our nation and where we're headed? Giving approval to all of these things when we just turn from God? And so as we close our time, there's good news to come. Come back next week, but I won't leave you there. I just want to ask you, have you been saved from His wrath? Because friend, listen, if you haven't settled this today, you're still an object of the wrath of God. You are still the focus of His divine fury. You say, well, gosh, wow, come on. No, everything that, that is against Him, He hates. And so the final piece of the puzzle is our redemption. And it comes to us because of this single verse we'll memorize later in the summer, Romans 6.23, for the wages, the payment of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's what I want to do to close our time. I want us to pray together, okay? And, and settle this before the Lord right now. You've heard a lot today. But let's, all, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Would you do that with me? And I just want you to think about your own relationship with God right now. Friend, do you know Him? This is not something... Uh, to be uncertain about. Because if you do not know Christ, if you've not received this righteousness that comes from Him, you are still under the wrath of God. And so what God hates are those things that come against those He loves, and ultimately the greatest enemy is death itself. In all its forms, God hates death. So He's done something about it. In the person of Jesus Christ. So on the cross, all of our unrighteousness and ungodliness is placed on Jesus. And the wrath of God pours out on His Son as our substitute. And the gospel, the good news of our salvation is made possible for each of us. So friend, right now, if you've not settled this before the Lord, before you go today, you need to say, Lord, I, I, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I believe that you took my sin upon the cross. I believe that I am lost without you. I bring nothing to the table. I need your salvation. I'm desperate for it. And friends, for those of us who today, you know the Lord, you've, you understand to, to appoint this message of salvation. Celebrate in that. And now He's called us each to live lives of justice, fairness, equity, to live out this kind of life of righteousness in our world today, this week, and in the days to come. So Lord, we praise You for the righteousness that has come to us in Christ. We respond with lives of worship. It's in Your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.